स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया good morning so we continue our discussion of new hollywood second wave director so we have been talking about the first wave francis capola hal hb arthur penn and and several others of that period and second wave directors key people are paul schrader and scorsese schrader was of course also a screen writer who has collaborated with martin scorsese on a couple of major projects we have de palma okay who was hugely influenced by hitchcock's style john millies basically a screen writer and we'll discuss his work also terence malick uh, a very uh, significant filmmaker who has a very uh, restricted body of work and we'll look at some of his major films and then um, in between we have someone called michael cimino who made the great one and only great movie of his career that was the deer hunter we'll also discuss at length some major films of roman polanski <clears throat> and then we'll see how the new hollywood movement it was all neatly tied up with the advent of spielberg and george lucas so these are the key people and uh, just to recap whatever we have been doing so far what was new hollywood all about first wave as well as second wave directors they aspired to become authors we have to remember that and what was author theory it was basically the uh, driven by director you know, director heavy films director is the um, key figure in in these movies rather than the producer or the star so they were not star vehicles they were not high budget films which was produced by a big studio but the director na- director's name carried the film forward that was the idea of author theory especially in america these films were characterized by complex characterization this is you know uh, more and more uh, uh, correct characters on screen they became inwardly conscious more and more like uh, dostoevsky in characters the, the dostoevsky was a huge influence on most of these uh, uh, second wave directors for example paul schrader the way he uh, uh, conceptualized travis bickle's character in taxi driver so it's all based on uh, works by dostoevsky especially notes from the underground <coughs> sorry uh new wave new hollywood movies were also character and theme driven rather than plot driven okay so plot was not that important but it they were more study in characters and more uh, centered on a particular idea rather than building a very uh, cohesive plot very well structured plot around it new hollywood films were all about building up a character and doing an in depth study of that character for example the other day we were looking at mean streets and someone rightly pointed out that uh, harvey keitel's character is torn between his uh, fascination for the street life the gangster's life as well as his uh, commitment towards his uh, catholic upbringing okay so mean streets on the other uh, uh, like most movies of uh, the new hollywood period was extremely character driven so that's what we have to remember they were not plot heavy the big <coughs> studio movies classic hollywood movies used to be uh new hollywood movies were extremely personal in nature director's own personality came to the fore now consider people like coppola consider people like roman polanski and we will soon look at his major features 
um, consider people like Schrader and Scorsese, they made personal films, authors all and they made personal films, films which were a reflection of their own uh, character or personality, okay, extension of their personality. This you can't say about the films of the older authors, for example, Howard Hawks <coughs> or even John Ford. So, those things were not found in them. So, you can't say, oh, John Ford is like this because you, are, you look at John Wayne characters in the searchers, that is not the case. But here, when you see Harvey Keitel is like this, you know that is Martin Scorsese himself is like that. So, therefore, we are talking about <coughs> new Hollywood movie, which, which, which was intensely personal in nature. We have already talked about music, most of it, most of which was sourced and they did not believe in creating an original soundtrack for that. That came much later, of course, there were movies which, talk, which which became major blockbusters even in the late 70s, but that is not the major feature, that is not the key element of the new Hollywood period. Okay. So, Terence Malik, uh, major film, uh, first major film was Badlands, based on, it again it is a Bonnie and Clyde kind of story, based on the real life 1958 Midwest killing spree of Charlie Starkweather and his 14 year old girlfriend Carol and Fugit. So, these were real life people on whose uh, escapades the movie was made. So, think Bonnie and Clyde, think natural born killers and Terence Malik. Uh, this, uh, uh, so, this was also a period when uh, filmmakers were looking around for original stories which can, which they can, um, uh, you know, explore around, rather than developing a screenplay, uh, which was based on someone else's material. Remember, uh, the apprehensions Coppola had before making The Godfather, what were the prob, what were the, what were the issues they had with The Godfather, because it was already made on, it is based on a novel and nobody, the uh, so called authors or people who had ambitions of becoming authors, they did not want to uh, make films based on someone else's material, they wanted to develop their own materials. <coughs> so, Terence Malik was highly original in that way. Do you remember any other movie? I think Ranjit has watched one of his movies in earlier courses. Days of Heaven. Okay, so another major movie by Terence Malik is Days of Heaven. Where should I write it? Don't confuse it with Days of Thunder. <laughs> that is Tom Cruise. That's a high concept film. <laughs> we were talking about Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. Now, while all these th things were happening in Hollywood, we had another major talent emerging, George Lucas. George Lucas, who we all know as the director of Star Wars. His first film was a sci-fi movie, 1971, THX, which is set in 25th century. Okay, so goes a step beyond Matrix, and Lucas. Remember, we often mention Lucas and Spielberg in the same breath. Hmm? They collaborated on Indiana Jones, of course. What? Why else? Yeah, science fiction movies. Okay, so, they were always interested in making the so called science fiction genre of films okay. and these films do not come cheap, they are always big budget. And what was the new Hollywood concept all about? 
low budget movies okay so you have to remember why um, they stand out among the plethora of the other new wave hollywood uh, filmmakers another point that another feature which both lucas and spielberg had in common was that they, they both came from small towns they were not like new yorkers or people who were born in la capola and scorsese are new yorkers remember other filmmakers are all majorly from la both lucas and spielberg come from small towns and this reflects in their movies why these people had grown up on those classic hollywood kind of films so the movies that their small town theaters would show would be those classic movies which talked about american individualism heroism okay and strong plots so this is this is a major contention that lucas had against the new hollywood cinema <clears throat> he said every movie in the last 10 years has pointed out how terrible we are okay that americans are terrible people in the last 10 years that's all we have been doing how wrong we were in vietnam how we have ruined the world okay and lucas said it's time to go back to a more utopian kind of cinema so further he said i wanted to preserve what a certain generation of americans thought being a teenager was really about from uh, between 1945 and 1962 now uh, john kennedy was assassinated after this period 1945 is a period of america's peak america was at its peak in terms of its economy and its political power it became a major superpower post second world war right okay and this is the best period in american history there were no political assassinations okay there was there was no vietnam and he wanted to hark back to those times result was american graffiti how many of you have watched the movie no watch it okay this is a must watch for anyone who is interested seriously in uh, films american graffiti 1973 it's set in 1950s america a small town again for that matter even spielberg's et is set in a small town <clears throat> so it's a nostalgic take on america's glorious past it's about um, teenage rites of passage and it kick started the careers of ron howard richard dreyfus and harrison ford the basic plot is very simple two school boys they have just finished just out of high school they have been admitted to a city college and they are ready to fly out of their small town nest the anxieties they go through through okay, before joining college and it's it's a movie um, which is very tightly structured okay within a span of 24 hours and what they think and what they discuss their anxieties their concerns their discomfort with losing something which is so comfortable you know warm cozy environment and seeking out careers in an unknown world cold unknown city no one knows it. so all those things and it's a a lot of talk lot of music and lots of boys bo- bonding so um, that's the movie all about and mo- uh, the, um, one reason for its enormous success and popularity was that sound it was ap- uh, out and out soundtrack driven every major incident has a score for it all sourced music and in during the 50s there was a popular teenage rock band billy helly and the comets rock round the clock and that is the theme music theme score of american graffiti again we were talking about scorsese 
uh, his very first feature included was, who is that knocking at my door? And you see picture of Harvey Keitel coming out of a theater and uh, what is that, th what is the movie? Rio Bravo by Howard Hawks, Howard Hawks starring John Wayne and Dean Martin. Okay, so again, Scorsese making a very personal, very first feature, a very personal movie, homage to Howard Hawks. Okay, that is what we are looking at. This is what they have been doing. This is the kind of cinema they made, which were an extension of their own personality. After Mean Streets, which we have already discussed at some length yesterday, so after Mean Streets, uh, Scorsese became real big. Many people wanted to work with him and uh, the studio gave him uh, the script of Alice does not live here <coughs> anymore, which is the only movie you know, which is so called you know woman centric in Scorsese's oeuvre. So, it, it deals with the trials and uh, anxieties of a woman played by Ellen Burstyn. Okay, she won uh, the Academy Award for this. The movie has become so popular because of its strong feminist overtones that uh, there is a feminist critic called Teresa, Teresa Lauritis, who has written a book called Alice Doesn't, Alice Doesn't by Teresa Lauritis. It is a book about feminist representation in Hollywood cinema of the 70s. Okay. Another feature of this period was of course, the <coughs> influence and impact of method acting and we have already done method acting to, to some extent. Themes and characters as we were talking about. So, characters were social, socially defined, non-conformist, the proverbial outsiders, more inwardly looking, more inwardly conscious than socially conscious heroes. Directors believed in a strong ex expression of their individuality. <coughs> So, the heroes now did not have any case to investigate, unlike uh, the Humphrey Bogarts, the Noah heroes. There was no woman to love and to die for, there were no goals, defining goals and the so called affirmative consequential model that was totally astute. And this model was replaced by open endedness. A good example of this open endedness is uh, the cinema of Nicholas Roy. I will write his name here. Nicholas Rogue. Do not look now, I am not asking you. <laughs> then don't look now. That's the title of the movie, starring Julie Christie and um, Donald Sutherland. And another movie of his that I often refer to is Performance. <clears throat> so don't look now and. Performance is just one or two of the movies starring the great Mick Jagger, the Rolling Stone rock star. Yesterday we were talking about the interest in demonic possessions, poltergism and satanisms. So, two major blockbusters of that period. The Exorcist, William Friedkin's movie, which was preceded by his blockbuster The French Connection, 
we have already seen what a major blockbuster the exorcist was and carry by brian de palma so both these uh, movies in uh, horror belonging to the horror genre and extremely interested in the supernatural and demonic possessions movies of this time were also critical of politics and media this is important okay and the war all gave us a gave us an immortal expression what's that critique of media 15 minutes of fame he said in future anyone can be famous for 15 or any person can have their share of 15 minutes of fame and what do you have to do for that say or do something absolutely inane or out outrageous and you will be well known you don't have to really do anything significant okay so you don't have to be uh, a great actor or a great political leader or a, um, a great economist to be splashed all over the place okay so that's what network is all about network is about how media plays the celebrity game how media hype certain people just to up their trps and we are talking about this movie which was made in during the 70s okay so very important movie both Na uh, nashville and network and network has uh, a, a, you know a very impressive cast fair dunaway robert duval Peter Finch, William Holden. Okay, so an excellent movie, and Nashville we have been talking about, and it's set in a small town called Nashville, directed by Robert Altman. Now, <coughs> Roman Polanski, another major director of that period. How many of you have seen his short film Two Men and a Wardrobe? please do make a note of it two men and the wardrobe by roman polanski and it tells you a lot about how polanski is interested in exploring the twin issues of time and space it's a very abstract film not easy to understand i remember we were shown this movie when i was at ftii pune and we spent the entire day discussing what it's all about it's not a very easy to understand but that's the Oh, entire idea about repulsion is starring uh, the french actress catherine deneuve set in london and it's all about isolation and paranoia two recurring features in the films of roman polanski do you know his background we are uh, still talking about uh, new wave directors making intensely personal films do you know anything about polanski's background his wife sharon was murdered by the manson family uh, but that was following uh, the phenomenal success of rosemary's baby hm so that's uh, uh, that that's his uh, life after he became big but what was what happened to him earlier he uh, was a polish jew and uh, is some of you are already familiar with sophie's choice william styrons and um uh, during the peak of anti jewish anti semitic feelings in uh, europe polanski along with his family i'm talking about his parents uh, he was captured and they were being deported to auschwitz 
and his mother threw the little boy he was just 8 years old somehow she managed to open the door of the moving train and threw him out okay after that he never saw his mother again <clears throat> she died while she was in auschwitz his father survived but those harrowing memories always remain with him so therefore this constant feeling of paranoia suspicion and betrayal it's always there in his films and then of course following the tragic uh, event of his wife's murder by a serial killer and that was another very uh, uh, you know uh, um, a harrowing period for roman polanski do you know any other movie by him china town of course we'll talk about but anything else he has done what else happened to him leave the usa because of uh, claims of uh, molesting a child yeah so because of that when his movie the pianist was nominated at the oscars last day he, he couldn't go to america good of yeah so uh, he is still living in exile self imposed exile because in the usa he is a wanted man he has been charged with uh, statutory rape okay um the woman uh, that people say that she was not exactly a child but a minor so the recurring themes suspicion human cruelty were least expected dark intrigues pagan rituals have you watched rosemary's baby okay please do watch it <laughs> okay so you will understand a lot about pagan rituals in new york So, Rose Rosemary's Baby, based on Ira Levin's novel by the same name, is the entire movie is set in a New York apartment. The leading man is played by the great director John Cassavetes. We have been discussing his films. In the movie, he is a New York method actor, and. Uh, is not doing too well so the implication is that he has made a pact with the devil so the uh, you know the ironic sub subtext is that that actors can go to any length to make it big rosemary believes rosemary played by mia farrow okay who later became woody allen's muse wife and then nemesis <laughs> okay so she was many things but after rosemary's baby she made another uh, rosemary's baby was a big success critical as well as commercial uh, this was followed by um, uh, the great gatsby okay where she plays daisy to to daisy to robert redford's gatsby jay gatsby the uh, film was written screen was written by coppola and after that her career was in hibernation till she was re rediscovered by woody allen <clears throat> so rosemary believes that her husband is in league with satan and that when she is pregnant she believes that uh, her baby will be taken away from her by her uh, demonic neighbors and believes that her husband is also in league with her neighbors who are all followers of satan so they fo do these they follow these pagan rituals and have some gems and pieces of jewelry which have strange fragrance fragrance emanating from them so all these things are, uh, it's a very dark very intriguing film and is open ended at the end she believes she has given birth to satan okay so she has, so it's called the year of the great satan 1966 is believed to be the year of satan and she believes she is the mother of satan at the end she looks at the baby's face we are never shown the baby's face and that's where the movie ends we don't know what the baby actually looks like whether she was dreaming it all along or she she is just going paranoid because of her claustrophobic surroundings 
or whether indeed she has given birth to Satan. We are never given satisfactory responses to that. His most successful movie, Chinatown, 1974, it has number of great lines. The movie ends with the, uh, the detective Escobar telling Jack Gittis, played by Nicholson, forget Jake, it's Chinatown. So, Jack Nicholson is a, a hard boiled detective, almost in the Nobel League of Humphrey Bogarts and other detective heroes from film noir. Chinatown is a neo noir. Okay, neo noir, how do we differentiate the classic noir from neo noir? Are there any differences? If I tell you, usual suspects is a neo noir. Memento is a new noir, the, and Chinatown is the first of neo noir. Then, what are the features of this genre, sub genre? The classic noirs were all of the late 30s and 40s and early 50s, I guess, but uh, after that time, I think it was the musicals which came into prominence, and it was only from the 70s that we have film noirs popping up. Renewed interest in noir. Okay, but are there any defining features of neo noir? I am not just talking about the period, but are there any define? Is neo noir in, in any way different from the original noir? Not exactly, not exactly, except that in neo noir you have more, many more contemporary than contemporary themes to reflect on. Okay. So, if there is memento, then what are the themes? The construct of memory, okay. that is a very important feature of neo noir, how memory plays its role in defining characters and uh, pushing a plot. The basic theme is that of land grabbing in California. You should do some research on this, land grabbing in California, I think you would know, Ranjit, you are into this kind of city studies and all. So, do look up on the land grabbing and developing of the entire California valley. Okay. How did that uh, city become so prosperous all of a sudden? What games did real estate people play in uh, um, making that particular valley so prosperous and rich that the price has just skyrocketed. Okay, so, there, there is a history there, there is a lot of you know, uh, financial intrigue happening there. So, please look it up. Uh, Chinatown starred Jack Nicholson, John Huston, okay, John Huston who was also a director. What did he direct? The Maltese Falcon, remember, with Humphrey Bogart, the treasure of Sierra Madre, Faye Dunaway, and it, the movie was produced by Robert Evans. Robert Town officially screen wrote the screenplay for this. This is one of those movies where he was not just mm, the screen uh, the script doctor, but also the um, the official writer. For the major part of the movie, this is the way Jack Nicholson look like. Yeah. Why? The thugs who are involved uh, in uh, land grabbing and he is the detective, he is investigating a murder and the thugs uh, catch hold of him and they say, you are a very nosy man and you know what we do to people who are so nosy, <laughs> we cut off their noses. So, they try and the hand that chops off Jack Nicholson's nose belongs to Roman Polanski himself, okay. the director making an appearance as a thug, okay, very self referen referential, self conscious. Uh, in Chinatown has several great moments, but 
the subtext is incest and that is a very important part of the narrative. This is the, this is where the suspense lies. Faye Dunaway's character, who is uh, John Huston's daughter in the movie and later on we are told that um, she has been molested by her own father when she was 14 or 15 and has given birth to her father's child, a daughter. So, at the end when Jack Nicholson confronts her and he asks her, who is this girl? Okay, tell me the truth, I want the truth and she says, she is my sister and he slaps her. Then she says, she is my daughter and he slaps her again and then she blurts out, she is my sister and my daughter. Okay. And then she asks him, if he is able to understand. What there is no like elaborate expression, uh, explanation for that. Just that one moment tells us the entire thing and the depths to which this man, the so called very respectable real estate person played by John Houston, he can stoop to. Bolansky's later works, of course, he had those issues, the legal issues and he had to leave America, but then he made frantic with Harrison Ford, it is again a homage to Hitchcock, it is a very suspenseful movie. The Ninth Gate, how many of you have watched the movie? It is like the Da Vinci Code or uh, 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 that movie with uh, Sean Connery, um, The Name of the Rose. Remember the name of the rose based on Umberto Eco's novel. He is a medieval priest, Sean Connery, and he is in search of, of a very enigmatic lost text by Aristotle. Okay, that is fictional. There is no enigmatic lost text by um, Aristotle. But the entire movie, the entire suspense is built on that premise. So, in the ninth gate, Johnny Depp is a rare book dealer and he is tracking down copies of a satanic text. So, again look at Polanski's interest in paganist rituals and, and satanism. He won the Oscar for the pianist, I think Adrian Brody won it too, the best actor and, and through this movie he revisits the memories of Nazi occupied Poland. He made a musical Oliver Twist in two th based on Charles Dickens novel and the ghost writer. I am sure mo most of us here are familiar with Pierce Brosnan's almost along the lines of Tony Blair, right? The ghost writer which is a tale of political intrigue. Another great director of that period, Alan J. Pakula and he has made a number of uh, political thrillers, Clute, Parallax View, it is about political assassination, <clears throat> All the President's Men, his most popular movie starring Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman and is based on which event? The Watergate scandal, Deep Throat. Presumed Innocent is a murder mystery based on uh, Scott Tarot's novel of the same name, Harrison Ford and the Pelican Brief, Julia Roberts and Denzel Washington. We were talking about the, uh, how the new wave Hollywood directors were more interested in sourcing music and not in developing or creating an original soundtrack for the pictures. But then one movie came along which changed the equations and it was such a huge movie, such a great blockbuster that it went on to influence a generation um, of musicals, a generation which was hugely influenced by musicals all over the world. There was a period when everybody wanted to look like John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever directed by John Bedham. Again, it is one of those coming of age rites of passage movie. 
it tries to rework the musicals of classic Hollywood period, uh, who the musical sensation, the musical stars of that period. Yeah. Good, Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly, okay, singing in the ring. Those were the musical, the dancing heroes of the 50s, the 40s. Okay. And Travolta brought back the dancing hero, the category of dancing hero. Tony Monera is working class Italian American lower uh, middle class family from Brooklyn. He has no ambition, remember. Okay, so, he leads a very mundane kind of life, works in a paint, um, in a hardware store, a paint store. But, he comes alive on Saturday nights, okay, where he dresses up and goes to a very gaudy discotheque called 2001 Odyssey. Homage to Kubrick, of course. Uh, during the same period in uh, Hollywood, there was something called Studio 54. Look this up. This is your homework. You have to watch lots of movies and then you have to look up Studio 54. Studio 54 was kind of a very elitist discotheque that only the very rich and influential can uh, find an entry. But then uh, in Travolta's Saturday Night Fever, because they come from a certain background, you can't go to a place like Studio 54. So, therefore, they have to invent a place, 2001 Odyssey, where people like Tony Monero could walk in. So, of course, it brought back the musicals uh, in fashion and in many ways it also reinvented men would dress okay and for a very long time you would find every young man dressed up the way um, john travolta's character would be dressed up in the movie you have to look it up to understand his fashion music by the gibb brothers and then the legacy of the movie is that it gave birth to the modern dance film. Some of the most well known in are Grease, again starring John Travolta, Olivia Newton John. Grease is also a stage play. Footloose with starring Kevin Bacon, very young Kevin Bacon. Dirty Dancing, Patrick Swayze, and then there were several imitations, including you can think of a movie like Fast Forward. Okay, so the, uh, you know, you know, a string of movies that followed that imitated the success of Saturday Night Fever. It's a very dark movie in uh, patches. It's not like uh, American Graffiti or even the Diner. You are you aware of the Diner? Barry Lewinson, just note it down, I won't be able to do so much of New Hollywood, but you should know the diner, which is again like American graffiti set in a small town in Baltimore. Barry Lewinson directed. To you guys, Barry Lewinson would be best known for Rain Man. Rain Man. So, he is the director and The Diner is another very uh, beautiful coming of age movie starring again Kevin Bacon and Mickey Rourke, very young Mickey Rourke. So, uh, this is the last movie today that I would be discussing, Michael Cimino's The Deer Hunter. Michael Cimino could never repeat the success of the Deer Hunter. Uh, I think we have already done excerpts from the movie, the Russian roulette scene. It's a classic Vietnam picture, came along the heels of coming home, Hell Ashby's, 
the boys in company and go tell the Spartans all Vietnam pictures made in 1978. And Francis was still shooting Apocalypse Now, his magnum opus in Philippines in rain, in rain water and thunderstorms and that was released in 1979. The Deer Hunter, if you have not already watched it, please do watch it, one of the most influential films of that period. It uh, tells you the story of a group of working class Russian Americans from Pennsylvania, such small steel town where most people work in steel industries. And they, uh, these, uh, this group of young men, they enlist for the Vietnam War, but before enlisting there are two rituals that have to be followed. One is, one of their friend, Steve, okay, by, uh, played by John Savage, he gets married to his sweetheart. Second is, the men take a trip, a deer hunting trip. The leader of the boys is Robert De Niro. The movie begins with an extended wedding sec sequence, again uh, you know paying homage to Coppola's God, The Godfather, where all the characters are in, uh, introduced and the plot is set. And then suddenly we are taken to the war scene, in the middle of the war, it is not, we do not see people firing away at each other. We just find that this, the same group of young men who we just watched getting married and participating in rituals, they are taken prisoners by a group of Vietnamese and uh, they are forced to play the game of Russian roulette. There were protests from many anti-war Americans that uh, this actually did not happen, the Vietnamese did not force anyone to play Russian roulette, and it is, but then for, for Trimino, that was a metaphor for the brutality of war. He just wanted to show you how evil war could be. Movie was hugely received, phenomenal reception, it won four Academy Awards, best picture, best director for Trimino, supporting actor for who? Christopher Walken and editing. Chimino became the toast of town, a new author in the making. So, thank you very much and we will continue tomorrow.